All right. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, it's an exciting topic for us to talk about. We're going to be talking about uh, cost segregation. But first, um, I'm going to introduce myself and then Jeff here. My name is Jerry Frank. I'm co-founder and, uh, and CEO of Stratifolio. So we are a cloud-based software solution focused on that small to mid-sized commercial real estate owner. And we've designed our product to help our owner operators, operators save both time and money when managing their portfolio. So today's discussion is about cost segregation and ways you can lower your taxable income, which is a very important topic right now. With us today is Jeffrey Cover. He's a consulting partner at Carr, Riggs & Ingram. He's based out of New, or New Orleans, and he has been at this now for 10 years. So the format, like always, is 20 minutes of discussion followed by 10 minutes of, of Q&A from the audience. So why don't we just get started? Thank you so much for being here, Jeff. Thank you for having me, Jerry. Yeah. And I guess good afternoon to everybody, albeit <laughs> digitally. <laughs> So the very first thing is, what is a cost segregation study? Sure, sure. Uh, so a cost segregation study uh, at its most basic definition is a strategic tax tool that allows taxpayers uh, and primarily taxpayers who have uh, real estate in their portfolio to defer some of their tax liability and their taxable income by accessing uh, depreciation that's caught up in these 27 and a half or 39 year uh, asset lives. So we're pulling up deductions into the present. Uh, and the segregation study provides the taxpayer with uh, an entire basis to support both of their position as well as to the best of their ability, maximize the benefit uh, and defer those liabilities into the future. Okay. So tell me more about accelerated depreciation. How does that actually work? Sure. So um, to start with the definition of what accelerated depreciation is, we really kind of start with what is depreciation and where uh, where an asset sits. Uh, so the typical taxpayer, if they were going to acquire or develop an asset, right, they're going to develop a commercial building that's uh, going to have tenant space that's going to be rented out, or they're going to use mm -hmm. it in their active trade or business. Um, typically, the client will place that on their books at what's called uh, 39 year asset life, which means that asset's right. going to be depreciated evenly over 39 years. And every year right. they'll take one 39th of a deduction. Now mm -hmm. that's fantastic and excellent because you get access to this large investment that you've made as a client. But what typically happens is there's this timing difference between when the client's going to gain income on that asset and their ability to actually offset that income with their investment in that asset because you don't get mm -hmm. to take the entire deduction today. Mm -hmm. um, furthermore, most clients this day and age do not hold buildings or any other real property for 39 years, less to 27 and a half years if it was residential. Uh, and right. most people don't even hold it for 10 years. Uh, mm -hmm. And as such, they would really like to be able to access some of that asset value uh, and pull it into the future. Now. To do that uh, and to quote unquote accelerate that depreciation, uh, they mm -hmm. need a basis to kind of identify the value of those components that are within that building. Now, if they can have a basis to identify the value of all those individual components uh, and they can allocate part of that total taxable basis that was captured in that 39 year placed in service um, mm -hmm. number, they can put it in an asset category that's five, seven, 10, 15 mm -hmm. years, depending on the nature of that asset. We're looking mm -hmm. at say 15 year assets, those might be land improvements that are involved with the parking lot, the lights that are out there, maybe flagpoles, right. signage, landscaping, retention ponds, uh, you name it, we've seen it, uh, but it's everything mm -hmm. that's outside the initial footprint of that building. Or we're looking at you know 10, seven and five year assets, which are, components of the building that are, for lack of a better phrase, non-permanent. Um, mm -hmm. If we can okay. add a value to that, those five, seven, 10-year assets can be depreciated over five, seven, or 10 years, uh, thus taking some of that value and you know, accessing that depreciation over five, seven, or 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. Now, sorry, go ahead. 
Well, so so the, the, those values really are closely associated with the timeline of the life of those components too, correct? Correct, uh, and it's actually interesting. Many of the components, um, to take a step back, depreciation was defined in a, not to give a history lesson, but I am a professor as well, <laughs> uh, in 1986 uh, by this, this class, uh, asset class categories defined as makers or modified accelerated um, mm -hmm. recovery periods. Um, those were generally accepted uh, class lives for certain categories of assets. And mm -hmm. those categories of assets are defined kind of in three ways. One, they're specifically stated in the code that if you have an asset uh, that is this nature, let's say um, something used in the active trade of business, a piece of equipment or something like this, it'll be assigned an asset life. Yeah. Um, now, some of that's very bright line uh, and you could easily say that this piece of equipment should be five-year property. Um, however, mm -hmm. we look around any given building, and I love to use kind of this, this back wall as an example. This back wall is comprised of many things. They have insulation back here, drywall back here. We have metal frame studs, and we also have this mm -hmm. vinyl uh, kickboard against the wall. Now, all those comprise the wall and the building, but that vinyl kickboard, mm -hmm. um, you know, doesn't have a useful life of 39 years. It could be right. removed. It's not permanent. Um, right. It's just difficult to assign a value. So that Mm -hmm. Kickboard there is a great example of, um, you know, a five-year asset that you can take off of a building uh, that may not have been originally defined as stuff. And those are not necessarily defined in the IRS code, but they're defined in this, this uh, litany of case law and IRS guidance that came out after the original asset codes were created, uh, thus giving mm -hmm. cost seg preparers like myself and other experts out there uh, the ability to go analyze the property and see the nature of the asset and then pick a life that's most favorable for the taxpayer. So mm -hmm. very long-winded explanation, I realize. Uh, <laughs> and by doing that, we can actually you know, bring that deduction in time. So again, it's, again, it's the accelerating that deduction up until today, mm -hmm. giving taxpayers access to what many times is their largest investment uh, on their right. balance sheet, or they're just right. in the business of investing and renting commercial real estate, and they need to offset that income that they're making off of. So are there certain targets that you go after when, when you bring on a new client and you're doing a cost segregation study? Are there are those some low-hanging fruit that you always go after? Yes and no. So uh, I'm going to say yes, there is, because there's always... Yes styles of property that are going to generate uh, more deductions than other. Uh, but before I go into some of those great targets, I do want to just say any property might be a good property. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into the it's a later into the uh, into the meeting about talking about what the, the process of analyzing looks like. Um, but when in doubt, just ask the cost egg provider to run an analysis and they'll should be able to tell you for free what they think the benefit's gonna get. Now, mm -hmm. that being said, uh, there are some better targets than others. Uh, acquired property uh, is a great target. Uh, why is it a great target? Because the taxpayer has zero basis to identify any other asset except for 39 years. They've acquired one mm -hmm. building. They can only put it on the books at one value mm -hmm. uh, without using some sort of estimate. Um, this said, styles of properties uh, anything that is has a high level of uh, just customized buildings, so manufacturing buildings, um, uh, commercial real estate that has large um, or any parking facilities outside or external signage. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have hotels, restaurants have a lot of specialty equipment when it's inside it. Um, mm -hmm. Banks, office towers, you'll find a lot of the common area spaces has decorative components or mm -hmm. additional lighting in excess of general illumination that could be taken. Uh, as assets. Um, mm -hmm. So really working assets are we going to find the most value. But, but that being said, mm -hmm. even, even strip malls where there's a lot of tenant build outs paid by the tenants, those still have a lot of value because you have land improvements that can be identified and mm -hmm. you know other specialty um, decorative, non-functional, non-permanent components of that building. Mm -hmm. Are there any asset types that are not good targets for cost segregation? Uh, yes. Yes, and it, it's actually fun where the asset itself is typically not the not the 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 fact that draws the line in the sand. Um, so this is since we're playing with accelerating deductions, right? There is a cost value that 
the mm -hmm. end of the day, there's only so much value you can bring up at time. Let's say a cost seg study can bring up 25% uh, of an asset value to the current period. Now, if this was a million dollar building, um, that means I can bring up $250,000 into the current period and take that as a deduction potentially this year. Uh, it's one mm -hmm. thing I did not really talk about at the accelerator, and I probably should have. Uh, since the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, anything placed in service before 2022, you would have been able to take 100% bonus depreciation on, which means you could take everything under 20 years in the current period. Hmm. It's going to sunset a little bit. We'll talk about that kind of towards the end as we see things yeah. to look forward to. Um, yep. But let's take this example. We have a million dollar building and we can identify 25% of that asset. 250,000 could be brought into the current period. Excellent. Justifies the cost of a study. Now let's say yes. that's a $100,000 asset and you've somehow come into a deal um, or you've done a 1031 exchange and you have a residual basis of only about 100,000 you're putting on your books. Well, 25% of 100,000, even if it's the same building is now only $25,000 of a deduction. Uh, and if you're going to take that as a after-tax impact, taking that deduction and multiplying it by the tax rate, um, let's say a 40% tax rate, you're only looking at about $7,000, $8,000 of benefit where it might not be a cost benefit to go out and get a study. So the typical biggest driver mm -hmm. we say of properties that aren't good target targets are either low cost properties, co properties that are under $500,000. We just don't see mm -hmm. the benefit recovery. Um, or properties that are very old. So if you've owned a property mm. for 10 years, I can go back and do a cost seg on any property, any point in time in your ownership of that life. You could have owned it for mm -hmm. 25, 30 years. I could do a study today on it and provide you some sort of catch-up depreciation on what you should have taken versus what you did take. Now, if it's 10 years old, you're already a quarter of the way through the life of that property and that catch-up right. is just naturally smaller. Mm -hmm. That being said, I always tell people, have us run the numbers. We'll show you what mm -hmm. it looks like. Uh, and you can make the decision for yourself whether or not you think it's a good business decision to pursue it or if it's mm -hmm. just not cost effective. Right. So how long does it actually take to conduct a, a, a cost segregation study? Uh, it can depend. But I will say the, <laughs> the industry norm is um, about six weeks. So, okay. and that's that's six weeks from engaged. We've received all the necessary information from the client. Uh, typically, we've performed a site visit, gone on site, and actually reviewed the asset, walked the property. Um, mm -hmm. Six weeks can get them a nice, large sixty to seventy page study that supports kind of all their all their tax positions. Excellent. Um, and what sort of documents should someone bring to the table if they engage you to do a cost segregation study? This is, this is actually a great question. Um, I will tell you, this is sometimes the hardest thing is collecting information, uh, simply because especially with acquired properties, things have either not been transacted, uh, not been handed over at acquisition, um, or sometimes from a record keeping standpoint, there's you know, hard file somewhere, it's not centralized in a specific space. And as a result, mm -hmm. it's hard for the taxpayer to, to bring us the information to actually do the work. Um, yep. To which I actually, we were talking about it earlier, you did mention that Stratfolio does allow taxpayers to accumulate all this information mm -hmm. in a centralized location, which Correct. makes our job easy and it makes their job easy because all they have to do is select everything and send it over and then and then we kind of deal with it on our end. <laughs> um, but not to not to digress. Um, excellent, excellent little excellent little tool because that's typically the the hardest thing we get is actually getting the information. Um, yep. If it's an acquired property, you know we're looking for sales documents. If there is an appraisal done, uh, either for banking mm -hmm. or for acquisition purposes, or for insurance purposes, or you know future repair and maintenance needs, we'll review those items. Mm -hmm. If there are plans available, we'll take them. Uh, for acquired property, more often than not, those plans have been lost at the time, uh, mm -hmm. at which point we can still completely do a study. Uh, it'll just require us probably to come on site and do that site visit and walk through. And we'll work with whatever the client has. If there are fire escape plans that at least give us the layout of the building, if there's a site plan provided for some other permitting need, we'll review mm -hmm. that. Um, obviously, new construction, we do have the luxury of having a lot more documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so for new construction, digital copies of those blueprints, those plans, mechanical, engineering, plumbing, electrical, 
anything and everything that can be provided uh, will take. Um, a lot of times there'll be pay apps that are used in the AIA. Uh, using the AIA forms with the with the architect of the general contractor, those give us a lot of great information. Uh, to which, I really, really, you know, for all the clients listening out there, upload those documents to your Stratfolio. Somebody's <laughs> going to need them in the future. Uh, don't yeah. lose them to time. Don't lose them to an old an old uh, you know a USB that got lost. Put them in right. a centralized location so they can just be forwarded along somewhere. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, either yes. I will need it, or there'll be a fire, and an insurance person's going to need it, or there'll be yep. some other event, and somebody's going to need it quickly. And the yes. last thing you want to do is be digging through and trying to find them. Um, yeah, that is that is why we are here to make <laughs> searching for documents so much easier. Yes, yes. Um, and I know it's challenging being a landlord, so I know there's usually stuff everywhere. So more systematic it can be, uh, the better. Um, so with those documents, we could typically do whatever we we need on our end. Very, mm -hmm. very, very much black boxed. Um, that being said, I've been asked the question more often than not to say, hey, I acquired this property. I paid for it in cash. I walked up. I knew it was good property. I knew what I was buying. It was pretty much as is. I did none of the above. Right. Can I not do a study anymore? Am I am I out of luck? Uh, and, and the answer is no, we can still work with absolutely nothing and just might require a little bit more time for us on site. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, long-winded so, answer. So how do you ensure that all the components of a property are properly identified and categorized um, so that you can go through this cost segregation study? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So uh, maybe a great way to, to answer that question is to kind of back up and give the high level of mm -hmm. kind of your three main ways that you can allocate costs and which ones the IRS prefers and likes the best, uh, as well as um, based off of that, what do we actually do? Uh, and then after I usually give those two, the clients kind of give me this, it sounds like a lot of work, uh, <laughs> a little bit of don't worry, it's not terribly burdensome for the, you, the clients, just for us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so at its highest level, uh, there are three main styles of cost allocation or cost segregation. Um, mm -hmm. There is the management estimate. I bought a building. Eh, right. About 10% of that property must be five-year property. It's tell the CPA that. Maybe 15%, you know, 15-year property. We see it all the time. Um, we have gone back and corrected some because the allocations were just so right. not trustworthy. Um, IRS's least favorite approach. Why? It's all management's estimate. There's no supportable basis for it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the least favorite. Um, now, the most favorite is going to be an actual cost allocation where you know the actual cost of every component and you're able to put that cost in each bucket. Mm -hmm. um, even for new construction, that could be uh, a terribly burdensome task for anybody, the taxpayer, cost seg provider, uh, whomever, simply because a general contractor is typically the one who does the work. Uh, mm -hmm. And as a result, those records are just not available. You'll see right. everything on you know, one of the six division lines in your AIA document. Mm -hmm. um, so best as it's the most accurate, but also sometimes not just the most tangible, not the most fungible for a client to actually go out and do. Uh, nor does the IRS think that a client should have to for every one of these, simply because it's just so burdensome. burdensome. Right. Um, now, the uh, the method that we approach in the most widely used, uh, sorry, the most widely used method uh, is what's called the uh, cost allocation methodology, where we're using a standard costing base to then mm -hmm. identify a what's called a replacement cost new of the building, effectively mm -hmm. rebuilding the building using a standard mm -hmm. costing method. Um, this is for us, the RS means code, which is the same thing a contractor might use if they're estimating a project. Right. Um, so it gives a standard uh, costing methodology. We will rebuild the building based off of site visits, review of plans, appraisals, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, identifying a replacement cost new of every component, say the wall, the drywall, the kickboards, the heavy towel carpet on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and once we've identified that replacement cost new, we'll adjust it up and down based off of regional pricing, adjust it up and down for used property based on physical obsolescence and wear and tear. Yeah. Um, if it's got to be brought back in time for inflation, 
uh, at which point we have a great basis to say, excellent, that one component is a blank percentage of all the replacement cost proponents. Multiply mm -hmm. that by your tax basis, and we have a basis to say that 10 feet of kickboard there costs this much money, and I can take it as a five-year asset. Uh, Do you, and actually on that point around inflation, um, you know, thinking about all of the components of any building right now, they have seen fairly significant increases because of steel being hard to come by, certain components being hard to come by um, due to all kinds of, of trade and shipping issues. Does that now, when that those uh, prices have gone up, does that affect then that cost segregation study and what is actually potentially recoverable for you? Uh, it affects it in the way that when we're rebuilding that building as a replacement cost new, um, the RS means guide has generally accepted um, location-based factor adjustments for those different divisions of assets, so concrete, carpentry-based items, like anything based off of wood, uh, even labor-based that'll both give it mm -hmm. to us in time, as well as by physical location, because a piece of wood in downtown Atlanta is going to be more expensive than a piece of right. wood uh, or differently priced than a piece of wood, say, in, in, in country Mississippi, or if it's in downtown LA versus downtown New York, those prices right. are going to vacillate. Uh, uh, so yes, it would impact it, but it's all built in there. Uh, it's all mm -hmm. kind of built in on our end. Now, okay. every once in a while, a client has a situation where they're buying something very specialty, especially you know around steel, uh, where yeah. they're having something fabricated and brought in. Um, those items can be specifically priced to account for any specifically high costs related to an asset, uh, where mm -hmm. the cost egg provider can adjust and make sure the benefit, I guess, is maximized and the impact okay. is captured. Yeah, yeah. So are there any other asso <clears throat> uh, um, costs associated, associated with the cost segregation that people should be aware of? Um, not really. That's kind of the beauty about this, this, this product in general, especially for, uh, if you're if you're using a, a CPA to prepare it um, now, well, let me answer the question first. Um, most studies you'll find will be fixed fee, which means when you enter mm -hmm. the study on the front side and you're you know negotiating the proposal with the client, uh, you'll give a single fee. You'll have a retainer due up front, and then typically the remainder when the project is done. Um, mm -hmm. which is great because that means you as the taxpayer, when you're when you're looking at that estimated benefit and you're looking at the you know uh, estimated amount that you're going to be accelerating into the current period, you can mm -hmm. talk with your tax preparer and say, does this work? If it does work, then you know right. the cost of it. And you know uh, for a fact that you're going to you know get more for your benefit. I will say I've been a CPA for about 20 years. Uh, and doing cost I guess fantastic because you know if if you're a tax preparer, you're usually giving bad news as in, Mm. Hey, you owe this money to taxes. And you know, if you're right. an audit, you're a compliance person, you're giving people journal entries and, you know, telling them about their controls. As a cost seg provider, I give people money back, which is, which is fantastic <laughs> in the form of like, so it's this great benefit where they always are happy when they leave because they're getting a deduction they didn't, weren't going to get prior. Right. Yeah. You're just a bearer of great news, right? I try to be. <laughs> um. So I know you've been doing this for a, 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 about 10 years. Do you provide analysis of the financial benefits as you're going through that study? So, so uh, um, you get to the end and, and as, a, as a potential client, you know if you should move forward with something or not, correct? Correct. So, so the great part about having done this for so long and having an engineer, um, you know, I, I guess I didn't really at the beginning. I probably should have introduced the cost seg team is typically comprised of two parties. One, you're going to have uh, uh, an engineer who's you know trained, licensed engineer uh, who's going to be the one reviewing the plans, and they work in conjunction with the CPAs who will ensure that the engineering results are properly applied to the tax case law and IRS guidance. Um, so between our two parties, you know, we do a couple of hundred of these a year you're able to give a good guesstimate uh, <laughs> either based off of uh, a portfolio of results for property mm -hmm. style types you know your garden style apartments are typically going to see um, 15 to 20 percent say in land improvements uh, 10 to 12 percent in your five 15 year pro I'm sorry five-year property um, 
so I guess long short, uh, with pretty well good accuracy, we're pretty we're able to look just on Google Earth or renderings of a property and say, hey, here is the basis that you gave us. Here's when you mm -hmm. placed it in service. This is what we typically see for the style of property. And then looking at your property specifically, here's what we think. And we can even dial those general estimates up and down. Uh, so those clients can take this because this is the most important part, right? That we, we're not selling them something they don't need. They, right. We're selling them something they could use to offset those liabilities. So they can right. take those estimated benefits, uh, that analysis performed at the beginning, bring it to mm -hmm. their CPAs, uh, talk with their CPAs yeah. and say, hey, I have this cost seg provider. He thinks he can get me $250,000 in deduction. Is that something I could use? And is that a good decision for me? Yeah. Uh, if the answer is yes, yeah. That's wonderful. So um, tax-wise, are there anything that individuals should be thinking about from a 2022, 2023 tax year um, from an engineered tax services standpoint? Uh, sure. Um, first off, if for partnerships in two weeks is your filing deadline, right? Um, I think now is a great time when people are just starting to either get back their draft tax returns if they're going to file timely um, or mm -hmm. if they've closed out their books for last year and they have an idea of where their tax positions are going to be um, or if they've been mm -hmm. talking to the CPA and they're already biting their nails because they have to make this big estimated tax payment yeah. um, to look at their portfolio and say, hey, is there any real property I have? I have either mm -hmm. acquired assets in the current mm -hmm. period or do I have assets from prior periods uh, that we might want to look at for cost seg mm -hmm. to say, hey, if I brought additional deductions or if I brought a cost seg to my CPA, is this something that's uh, that I'm going to be able to benefit for? Uh, as well mm -hmm. as looking forward to 2023, you know, this, and not all taxpayers taxpayers do this, but um, you know, you pay taxes in two ways: you pay your final tax, either mm -hmm. your estimated tax at 315, 415, or your final tax when you final file. Uh, but for a lot of taxpayers, you also pay quarterly tax estimates to make sure you're not mm -hmm. getting penalized for underpayment throughout the year. Um, mm -hmm. A great way to use cost seg is to, because it's all about the time value of money, right? You're going to get mm -hmm. that million dollars of total property deduction. It's just a matter of if you're going to take 39 years or five years. Um, right. If you can lower your estimated tax payment because you already know you're going to get this deduction, You've acquired mm -hmm. a property in January, February of 2023. You have a study done. You can provide mm -hmm. your CPA tax preparer um, the study results and say, hey, I know for a fact I'm getting a $300,000 deduction this year. When you run my quarterly estimate calculation, take this into account. And a lot mm -hmm. of times that'll wipe out that income. So they'll be able mm -hmm. to say, you know what? I don't need to make quarterly tax estimates. I can yeah. use that for a repair project that was deferred. Right. I could use that as a down payment for an additional acquisition. Mm -hmm. It's free cash flow. You know, yeah. we're we're from we're from Louisiana, so I tell people, you know, you never know what's going to happen, so don't just go use it and buy a boat. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people do. Yeah. But yeah. all right. Well, before we close today, I, I did want to bring up an audience question we had from before. Um, and if you've been following along on any of our social media pages, you will have probably seen the news that that we shared last week that we have a new collaboration with Intuit QuickBooks. And so with that, we're excited to be a part of the Intuit Solutions Provider Program. So we now offer bundled pricing for Stratifolio and QuickBooks subscriptions. So the audience question here is, how does Stratifolio and my QuickBooks integration help me provide the necessary documentation to my CPA for a, a cost segregation study? Excellent question. Uh, and I think we've already tagged it a little bit so but yeah. I would like to expand on it because I think those two things work well together you know mm -hmm. uh, especially for QuickBooks online um, I know our our and I'm going to speak on behalf of some of our tax preparers here but a lot of them will have a you know prepare a login a read-only login mm -hmm. to QuickBooks right. um, and possibly even the uh, real estate management software but either way those are the two biggest areas that we utilize in our study right we're going to have from Stratfolio uh, all those documents uploaded yep. and initial acquisition yep. and or if there were remodels done or if it was self-construction, mm -hmm. everything that was uploaded and filed away in one spot. And mm -hmm. then eventually we're going to need to know that financial information. When was it placed in service and how much are you holding it on your books for? Mm -hmm. uh, if they're both in the same place, it's two clicks of a button 
uh, and mm -hmm. we have everything we need to run an analysis and mm -hmm. probably everything we need to complete the study right there. Uh, and if you send it to both us and the CPA, uh, we're able to work with the CPA to make sure things are accurate. So when it does come time for filing, uh, that the mm -hmm. numbers that are in QuickBooks are the same numbers that are going to be used um, yeah. in the study. Yeah. Uh, so really, I mean, uh, gosh, I love the digital age because everything can be in one place <laughs> if you take the time and the effort to organize it like right off yes. the bat. And if you have those yes. systems and processes in place, you have your financial information, you can you have an idea what your tax liability is going to be. You can tell if you're making money or not. Yep. You have all that qualitative documentation. Send it all <laughs> over as a zip file. Right. Call it a day. Oh, excellent. Yeah, we love it when our customers are growing and taking advantage of every opportunity that's out there to help them be more successful. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Jeff. Um, you can find Jeff's contact information here on the screen. Let me share that. And... I am not going to be able to share that, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, we will share that uh, in, in the contact information after we finish. Um, our next live event is going to be with Marissa at OTSO. Um, and she's gonna talk about some updates that their software has. Um, and that is a, a really good system to help track security deposits or it's an it's a alternative to security deposits. So that is it for us for today. Um, so please take care and we look forward to the next conversation. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Bye. I think you can hang up if you want. <laughs> My computer is frozen.